Thank you for downloading our podcast. The prophet Hosea receives a strange command from God. The Lord tells him to take a woman of the night to keep it clean. He is to marry a woman who does not protect the marriage bed. And he is to build a house with this unfaithful woman. How can the Lord order a prophet to do something contrary to what God has revealed in other places in his word? What is the purpose of this book? Overall, what is a prophet Hosea teaching us? Looking at Hosea and considering these feasts that Israel celebrating made me think of Luke's gospel where Luke has a real profound, or at least one of the sub-themes of his gospel, is a profound understanding of banquet festivals. And so when, when Luke talks about a banquet, or Christ talks about a banquet and Luke recounts this for us, Christ is very much distinguishing those who are really his people and those who are merely outwardly his people in terms of these festivals. And when we think about who's included in these banquet festivals that Christ thinks about, we go back to, be, to the beginning of Luke's gospel. We think about the, the tradition of synagogue worship, where if there is a well-known rabbi who's in town, it would be a, a custom f- uh, for the synagogue to allow that rabbi to take a portion of Scripture, to read the portion of Scripture, and to maybe give a slight exposition or, or maybe a homily even on that portion of Scripture. And I want you to imagine what it must have been like To be in a town where you know there's a guy raised by a carpenter, a guy who is self-taught, a man that some kook out in the wilderness says is significant in terms of your perspective, stands up in the synagogue and reads only from Isaiah 61 verse 1 and talks about the blind, the lame, Basically, the inferior, the captives, those in prisons, which we could read as the outlaws. That those are those who are saved and brought to the banquet. As Christ, or as Luke develops us in terms of that banquet scene. And then he says, this passage or this prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. I mean, can, can you imagine how arrogant that would sound? A carpenter's son standing up, reading from the great prophet Isaiah, and then taking the prophecy and applying it to himself. And the reason that individuals had such a hard time with this is because they lost sight of who Christ was, the purpose, the mission, the goal of the Messiah. And what's even more tragic in terms of the human condition is how we lose sight of ourselves. And how we have to see ourselves as the blind, the deaf, the broken, the imprisoned, and those who need a redeemer. And so when we look at the history of what Hosea's laying out, yes, this can get somewhat redundant and it can be a little dreary going through Hosea and hearing these uh, reminders of human depravity again and again. But there is a purpose in what Hosea is doing, and especially in chapter 9 when he's talking about the festivals of Israel. When we hear these festivals, we might say, well, what's the real significance of this? I mean, aren't they supposed to celebrate coming together? Isn't the whole point of the first fruit festival was to celebrate God's goodness and to know who he is and to celebrate that? How can this festival fundamentally testify to their failing as Hosea is is flipping the script, if you will. A a festival that should be celebration and thanksgiving is now a a festival of mourning. So as we consider this, we'll see first a disappointing festival, what it's become. Secondly, an overturned festival and how the prophet is speaking of its own uh, indictment and, and what's going to happen. And lastly, a prophetic forecasting of what's going to be the ultimate fate of God's people. And so let's begin with a disappointing festival. Basically, we can divide this, and I wouldn't say that the Hebrew is ultimately clear in terms of dividing points, but I would lump verses 1 through 4 together. 
uh, seeing this as, as a continual theme. And we look at this theme and, and what's going on. Then Hosea is rebuking Israel for selling out, to put it very politely. Now the Hebrew is a little more earthy and the English does bring this out. But basically it's a reminder that Israel has sold out. Uh, they've sold themselves. Uh, they're not those who truly understand uh, their God and seek to honor their God. Uh, but they are those who have sold them at themselves out and sold themselves to the false gods, to the Baals, to the calves, to the, 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 basically the symbols that represent Baal in power and, and all these things that are contrary to the living God. Now in terms of, of this festival, the, the intention of the festival was to be uh, most likely the Feast of Booths or it could be uh, also... Uh, basically the Pentecost festival or the Feast of First Fruits. And you read about this in Deuteronomy 16. And the point of this festival is something beautiful. Uh, even the Feast of Booze, and, and we think about that and its significance and how Israel commemorates their, their sojourning and, and their traveling. But ultimately it's, it's that remembrance that it's the Lord who provides for them the ultimate produce. So the first fruits, Pentecost, is where you have the first fruits of the, of the harvest and, and you're celebrating and trusting uh, in terms of this, this meal that the Lord's going to bring the fullness of the harvest. And so it truly is celebratory, eating a meal in the presence of God. But we think about then going on, we think about the harvest feast and, and what that means. And the whole point of that is as they gather together and have this joy of, of being in the presence of God and seeing the fullness. And so it's Israel ultimately called to think about this land being the land of milk and honey, the land of provision, having gone through the, the suffering and testing of the wilderness and arriving once again at another season of joy and celebration that God is faithful to his promises. And so the eating of this meal was never intended to be a meal just for the people. But the eating of the meal is the intention and, and a consciousness that they're eating it in the presence of God. And so it's, it's really this, this beautiful, wonderful picture of the heavenly banquet coming together as God's people assembled in one place with their God, coming to them, communing with them, and understanding that this is who they are, a people made alive by the living and true God who is near and dear to his people. And so in terms of, of the feast, this is the point of all the feasts. When you think even of the institution of Passover and how it is to be implemented and, and how they are to follow it, what are they to do? Well, there's to be an interaction. Father, son, recount being enslaved and what the significance of the different stages of the meal means and how it's God who brings us out by a mighty hand, right? And so it's communing and understanding it is God who has done this. We are his people. This is our redemptive purpose. And as we think about Leviticus 23 again, where you have these feasts and, and the rules and regulations for the feasts of how Israel thinks about God. Even the sacrificial system. You know, you, you have the sacrifice of thanksgiving as one example. Where this isn't something that's mandatory for the whole community. But someone might look and say, wow, God was really good in the harvest. I, I want to I wanna really celebrate this. And that's really what, what it is. It's a celebratory meal. And you'd go to the priest, you'd take some of the, the fruits of your harvest, the priest would prepare the meal, and then you'd sit down, most likely as a family, in the presence of the priest, symbolizing this sacrifice of thanksgiving before God. And so the, the whole point of the sacrificial system, the point of the feasts going on with Israel, is a call for Israel to be in the presence of their Lord. And so as, as they gather together, you say, well, then what's the problem? Because when Israel would come together for a feast, they should be rejoicing. This should be celebratory. Because here is their commemoration of God. They've moved so far from an enslaved, weak, 
captive people to a people who have been redeemed, traveled through the wilderness. Now they commune with God in the holy land that is literally a picture of heaven on earth was its intention. But the prophet doesn't say that. And so maybe Hosea is just a wet blanket, right? Maybe he's a guy who comes along and he's a rain on the parade, just ruins everyone's fun. So why is he so upset? What has Israel done? Well, when we think about the nature of the Passover meal and what's happened in Israel's history, when we have the division of the kingdom, right? Remember we talked about Jeroboam, Jettison, Orthodoxy, or just left. So we think of him as going north. As he divides, he, he conspires because he realizes that, you know what? If Israel comes together and, and joins in with this first fruits festival and, and as they have these feasts, they're, they're going to go down to Judah. And if they go down to Judah and they, they see the temple, well, we're going to pale in comparison. So he realizes what I need to do is I need to establish my own feast. And as I establish my own feast, they'll come together, they'll celebrate this, and so he sets up the golden calf. So this is a backdrop of, you know, the, basically the precious things of silver, the precious things of gold turning over to, to thorns. So these are the golden calves he set up. And who's the one who does the sacrifice and the tragedy of the institution of this meal? Well, it's Jeroboam. So Jeroboam, the, the king completely losing sight of Samuel, rebuking Saul for making a sacrifice, being impatient, is going to just make the sacrifice. So something that's been going on for 200 years. And so this, this isn't something where Jeroboam says, I'm going to immediately leave Israel and I'm going to just implement this. And the Lord says, no, you don't. And boom, immediately intervenes. This has been about 200 years. There's been a lot of time to repent, a lot of time to reflect, a lot of time to really think about the history of what Israel is supposed to be. They haven't repented. And so the, the implication here, as some would read this just as one of the honorable feasts that God has instituted in terms of, you know, maybe the Pentecost, first fruits, maybe the Feast of Booths, maybe something else re revolving around Passover. It's not any of that. This is referring to a feast that celebrates the division of Israel. And so the point of what's going on here is a tragedy of Israel coming together thinking they're doing something out of worship and love for God. And all it is is a love and celebration and a division of Israel. It's a love and celebration of the brokenness of the Judah king. It's a, a love and celebration of, of man's self-indulgence. And that's the point of what Hosea is going through. Oh, you think that you're doing something pious. You think you're doing something honorable. But what are you really doing? You're having a meal that is only providing earthly life. You've lost sight of God. You're not giving a drink offering to the Lord. You've lost sight of God. The bread that is supposed to be the fruit of your labor, the provision of God, becomes a mourner's meal. And so when, when you hear this, this is a fundamental twist, a fundamental misunderstanding of what Israel was supposed to be. So you look at Hosea 9, verses 1 through 4, you say, oh, well, that was a problem then. Well, read 1 Corinthians 11. What is Paul saying going on in the New Testament church? Something very similar, where they're taking the Lord's Supper and they're making it a celebration of their own indulgence, of their own speaking in tongues, of their own... Uh, pious manifestations of the spirit that they think show who they are and so here's a fundamental problem when we start making these meals and this worship in our christian life about ourselves we miss the significance of what god is doing this is why by the way i prefer to use the language of lord's supper over eucharist now if it's eucharist versus meal of mourning i'd go with eucharist but Eucharist simply means thanksgiving. And the reason I, I don't prefer that meaning is because Lord's Supper captures the intention of the Lord's meal, right? And so it has that twofold nature to it. As the church fathers always say, thing and thing signify. 
right? So you, you never want to look to the thing in the place of God is what that simply means. You always want to see the Lord who is the, the nourisher, the giver of good things. And so when we think about the Lord's Supper, we think about the reality, here we are coming into the presence of God. We're thinking of the Old Testament sacrifices, Old Testament festivals, and so there is a celebration. There's also that exhortation to examine ourselves and think about, you know, why, why am I doing this? How do I know I'm in Christ? How do I know the Lord is really good and gracious? Now again, you think about the medieval church taking this in terms of superstition, expecting immediate death if you're not properly prepared. That's not really hitting the, the intention of this either. But the thing we have to understand in these meals, so Hosea 9 verses 1 through 4, the fundamental problem with Israel is they are living in explicit sin. 1 Corinthians 11, the church is living in explicit sin of elitism and self-promotion and self-aggrandizing of thinking of self as better than others. So I speak in tongues, I have a prophecy. Rather than thinking, how do I do this for the honor and glory of God? And that's what Hosea is rebuking Israel for. You're doing this meal to check the boxes. You're doing this meal to manipulate God. You're doing this meal because you've lost sight of God, and you're doing this in the presence of the golden calves that you've built, thinking that God is one option among many, maybe in the best-case scenario. Worst case, Israel has completely lost sight of their God. And so you need to understand what Hosea is addressing in this context. This isn't something that happens immediately. It's been going on for 200 some years. They know better. And, and they should be seeking to honor the Lord and bringing glory to his name. And they should be coming together to celebrate who God is rather than trying to do this in their own strength and thinking they're doing this uh, in, in their own glory, basically, is what's going on. But again, it's coming before the living God understanding we are communing with him, having the privilege of having a meal with him, which is one of the great things uh, that Luke's gospel brings out, you know, in that whole banquet scene where Christ says, you know, it's better to sit at the foot of the table and have the owner of the banquet or the house kind of remind that you should move up to the head of the table because you're more elite. Rather than being on the head of the table and having the owner of the banquet going, <clears throat> Like, you got to move down. You don't belong here. And that's sort of what Christ is getting at and what Hosea is getting at. We want to be at a place where we discern and know who our God is, that we're seeking to honor him. Israel has lost sight of this. We are those who can lose sight of this. We need to recognize our God is a good, gracious, merciful God. We are the blind. We are the deaf. We are the captives that Christ has come to redeem. But going on then briefly, as we've already laid the groundwork for the festivals, we look at verses 5 and 6. Well, what do we find going on with Israel? So now Hosea goes on, he's asking them this, this point. Well, what are you going to do on this day of, of this feast and this feast that you say is of the Lord? Because he's saying you're going to be in a foreign land when you celebrate this. So when you go to celebrate this, this foreign meal, and, 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 and you're thinking that you're elite and you're celebrating your elitism. Well, you're going to be in Egypt. You're going to be in Assyria. You're going to be eating unclean food. And it's going to be pretty public and pretty obvious that what you're doing is not celebrating the feast of the Lord. And so again, as he writes us, he's saying, listen, as you're carried off, you're those who are going to understand that you're not having life. Now, as he asks this rhetorical question in verse 5, what are you going to do in Assyria? What are you going to think about in Egypt? Will you come back to the Lord? Will you think that the Lord is really your Redeemer? Will you finally be brought to a place of brokenness after 200 years of celebrating Israel's division? What are you going to do? Well, he says, this is what's going to happen to you. And this is not a happy picture. Because he says, you're going away to your destruction. Remember when the Lord brings a revelation to Abram about his uh, descendants being enslaved? 400 years you're going to be enslaved and then you'll, you'll be delivered. See, it's, it's tragic, but it ends in a great story of redemption. 
That's not what Hosea is laying out for the people. He's saying, listen, this generation, you're going to go away to your own destruction. Egypt's going to gather you up. Remember we talked about the nature of going to Egypt as a sign of a blessing, of the Lord bringing them back to needing another exodus event. That's not how he's using Egypt here. He's using Egypt as a threat of that hen, that eagle gathering together its victims and assembling them. And, and how do we know that? Because Memphis, what we find a city at that time, northern Egypt, is a place that's going to bury them. And so this is pretty tragic. He's saying, you're going to die in exile. You realize that, right? He's saying, you've spent all this time celebrating, you're going to die in exile in a foreign land. And then he points out the absurdity of idolatry. And this is where we've talked about the dangerousness of following our God, right? I mean, walking by faith, seeking to discern the Lord's will is not always easy, is it? Something where we, we go through life and, and, and we, we, we want the certainty of it all. And so you can see where Israel looks to the golden calf as a symbol of a God of strength, a God they can control and defy. But when we go through life with our God, we have to trust he's our shield and defender. And so with Israel, trusting in these symbols of the Baals and the strong gods and the big gods that are tangible, defined by human reason... Notice what becomes of them. They will be just like the common curse, right? There's an echo back to Genesis 3, Adam and Eve leaving the Garden of Eden. Thorns and thistles shall be your destiny. And so these foreign gods that they trusted in, that, that they most likely polished and cared for and kept shiny and beautiful, right? I mean, think about that as you're polishing this God, protecting this God. Like you would think, Maybe this is a little absurd. Isn't the God supposed to protect me and keep me clean and I shouldn't be keeping this God clean? But nevertheless, as we know, sin is absurd. Sin is something that, that doesn't make rational sense. But that's the reality. They can't protect their gods. And more tragically, their gods won't protect them. And they will break down and succumb to the consequences of the common curse. So very... Uh, briefly, as I've mentioned, here we have the overturning of this festival. They're going to celebrate it in a land for 200 years. What about a foreign land? What about when you think about the gods where you ate your feast in the presence of these gods that are now basically just broken down in ruins and no longer have any significance? Are you going to start contemplating who the true God is in those moments? And that's the question. That's the force. But going on then, as Hosea says in verses 7 through 9, we have this forecasting, and it's something that's repeated, and again, not something that's, that's very nice. The day of punishment, the day of recompense. So again, this echoes the day of the Lord. So as Israel, as we've mentioned, projects and shows the ideal of communing with God on, on a small scale, the ideal of being in the presence of God, right? The temple is showing God in the midst of his people, most holy place, priestly order, showing again the pictures of Christ, right? So it's, it's heaven shining down, showing the intention and reminder of where God's people are going. It's also a reminder, as Hosea has said in 6 verse 7, like Adam, they have transgressed my covenant. Israel serves another purpose, doesn't it? It shows the nature of the day of the Lord, a scaled down picture of Armageddon being fought here and carried out. And just to be the spoiler of, of spoilers, God wins. That's the point of what's going on here. The Lord's going to win, and he's going to make it right. And so when it says punishment and recompense, this is the Lord restoring justice and ultimately showing the outcome of his redemptive purpose. Justice will be served. The Lord will establish his reign. It will be public. And the fact that it's justice and recompense means Israel should know it's coming. Moses predicted these things. The prophets have said them. Hosea's not alone. And again, 200 years, 200 years of celebrating this festival, Israel should know better. But as he speaks of this justice, and he speaks of this recompense. He lays out how Israel views him. And it's tragic. 
Because it certainly harks back to the days of Noah, another picture of judgment that Peter recalls for us. And in that picture of judgment, it shows how the Lord delivers his people, distinguishes them from others outside the ark, right? That's what Peter recalls. Christ's victory as Noah builds the ark is forecasting, projecting, declaring the reality of what's going to happen. How do the people respond? Oh, this guy's nuts. He's crazy. What a fool. Well, what kind of absurd radical would believe these sorts of things? Well, that's what they're saying about the prophet. Ah, he's a fool. He doesn't know anything. We've been celebrating this feast for 200 years, and it's a great time. You ought to come out for it, right? I mean, you could hear the people saying this. And so they're saying, he's a fool. The man who claims to be in the spirit, ah, he's mad. He's insane. He knows nothing. Don't listen to him. Just ignore him. But we find that in their iniquity or their sin, they're hating the prophet. Now, you have to understand that when one hates the prophet, one's hating the word of God. And if one hates the word of God, one is hating the God who stands behind his revelation. This is a tragic day. It's a tragic indictment. And so Hosea is not confessing something about himself. He's saying, this is how you have treated me. This is what you were saying about me and the prophet. So it's not Hosea saying, woe is me. He's saying, this is what you're saying about the prophets. This is what you're saying about Moses. Think about what you're embracing and where you're going in this festival. It's not good. Because Hosea in verse 8 points out the significance of who the prophet is. The watchman. The watchman over Ephraim. Now a watchman's a very important person. Because if you have a nation coming against you, you're facing war, and you have an army, you know, setting up. Well, the watchman on the city gate is the one who alerts the king, alerts the army, alerts whoever he has to alert, saying, hey, there's somebody, there's some movement out there that looks rather threatening. It's coming against us. We might want to gather arms. We might want to get ready to defend ourselves, or we might want to send out some scouts and get closer and see what's going on. So your, your watchman is your first line of defense. He's not an alarmist. That's a bad watchman. But a good watchman is the one who discerns movement in the distance and says there's a threat. We need to do something about this. We need to move out and be ready. That's a good watchman. And so Hosea is saying that's the prophet's job. We're the watchman. We're warning you of an invading army that God is giving us the inspired word. It's not just we discern this. It's not just we see it. But God has actually revealed it to us. And this is the reality of what you need to do. Well, we find what happens. Well, he points out with Israel. The absurdity of a bird where a, a fowler's snare or one who traps birds. And is really good at trapping. He's going to make it seem like everything's safe. Everything's fine. Here's some nice free food. Enjoy the free food, right? So the bird gets down, eats the food, and all of a sudden it's trapped. And the bird that thought he was getting a free meal becomes the meal, right? That's what Hosea is pointing out, that irony. You, you've been lulled into this, this mindset that everything's fine, God's weak, he's not going to do anything, he's happy with you, saying, but, but he's not. You're, you're lulled into it like the silly bird who, who ducks down to get the free meal, thinks everything's safe, and all of a sudden that bird is on the trapper's table as food, one who has been captured. Because he tells us who they are. And this is where, again, we've already made allusion again to that tragic, tragic story in Judges 19 and 20 where the tribe of Benjamin is exterminated. I don't think it's necessary to relive that whole story, but it's something you can read when you get home. Judges 19 through 20 is a tragedy. Israel goes to the place of Sodom and Gomorrah, basically. And as they go to that place, the tribe of Benjamin is exterminated. And so Hosea, in his brilliance, is saying, don't think this is an unprecedented thing of the Lord coming against the people of God. Saying it's happened. Remember the tribe of Benjamin? Remember how they got exterminated? Remember how Israel had to come before the Lord and figure out how to repopulate this tribe? It was tragic. And yet we find this is what has happened to the people of God. And so when we look at, at this 
these verses. Again, this is, this is hard. I mean, this is harsh stuff to hear. This is a reminder that we are a people who definitely need a Redeemer. The thing we have to always be conscious of is that we can be distracted by the good things that God gives us and we can lose sight of our God. Now, it's not to say we do away with the good things God's given us. We don't just cast them aside and say, well, I'm just going to live as a hermit. You can find that in church history as well. That, that's not what God is commanding. But what is the prophet fundamentally commanding Israel to do? To keep their eyes on their Lord. And so when we begin our sermon thinking of Christ in the synagogue, using Isaiah 61, verse 1, as his launching point. This is is a wonderful passage in Isaiah, promising renewal, promising restoration. But the hard part for us as human beings is to truly recognize we need redemption. Isn't that the hard thing? I mean, if we really think about it, because once we own the reality that we need redemption, we're, we're affirming We're not whole. We're not complete. We're those who are naturally enslaved. We're those who are blind. We are those who are deaf. And so when when Hosea brings us to the community, he's not telling us, and Paul never tells us to do away with the Lord's Supper or anything like that. He's telling us to have a proper discernment of who we are before the Lord and to know the God with whom we commune. So often we can flip the script, can't we? We can think God needs us to to have an identity. God needs a people to have an identity. Hosea is reminding us God doesn't need us. God doesn't need our sacrifices. God doesn't need our, our lives of thanksgiving. God doesn't need us. And once we affirm that reality, we we understand the graciousness and long suffering of our God, don't we? That he comes to a people who are so foolish as to make gods of their own that they have to polish and protect and preserve. Jacob and Rachel, I mean, you think of that whole story of how she lies and and sits on her father's household god to protect her god, right? That's what we do in our idolatry. We try to protect our gods. And what Israel is reminding us of and what the Lord is reminding us of through the prophet is to truly believe that the life, the death, the resurrection of Christ is enough. Christ really has solved the fundamental problem that we have as humans. That is, we cannot come to God on our own terms. We cannot assemble before him in our own strength. We need a redeemer. And when Christ stands in the synagogue, that's not a statement of arrogance that this prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. It's Christ saying, I am the Messiah. Whether you believe it or not is rather inconsequential in terms of Christ's success, right? He doesn't need the people to believe he's a Messiah. In fact, we find that that the person who ultimately professes Christ to be the Messiah is the most unlikely person in Christ's darkest moment on the cross. And that's the thief on the cross. His disciples scatter. We find that John's probably there with him till the end. But whatever the case, by and large, he's alone being mocked. And yet, despite the reception of his people, he is still successful. He does not need us to protect him. That's the beauty of what Hosea wants us to fundamentally see through this. Our God is fundamentally different than the idols. Our God is fundamentally different than the gods that we make. He is our Redeemer. Let us bow our knees before him. Let us live our lives as living sacrifices, as those who commune with him, being united to him, joined to him. And let us fundamentally see that as we take hold of Christ by faith, we will come to that glorious, that glorious festival. Not of our own making, not of our own definition, but the heavenly banquet table. And you think of that feast, the feast of the Lamb, Christ instituting the Lord's Supper. He serves his disciples. 
a picture of Christ serving such a lowly, unworthy people. But that's the picture. Let us not then redefine who our God is. Let us not minimize his sovereign protective power. But let us continue then. Frustrations of this age, bring them to your God. Come before him in prayer. Read the Psalms and how they bring their frustrations before their God. Our God, the true God. Walk in him. Understand he is a God who will protect you. Understand that as Christ has been raised to life, There is nothing we have to fear because the ultimate fearful thing that we would have to face apart from Christ has been conquered. It's not death, but it's hell itself. Let us then see the sovereign power of our God. Let us learn from our ancestors of those who are given over, pursued false gods. And let us understand who we are as a wilderness people, a people joined to the resurrected Lord and Savior who has made us alive. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, You can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.